feels good to have my fan asking the first question. <laughs> Francois, thank you very much. Very interesting. I'm fascinated that you don't use the word to be, but there are more than one billion people who don't use the word to be. In Chinese, as far as I know, they don't have a word for to be, number one. Number two, traditionally, there was only we because the individual developed. The first man in the Western world to say I was Homer's Ulysses. I am Ulysses. And from 500 years before Christ on, slowly we developed the I. And number three, to think. Traditionally, all cultures thought with their heart. So in ancient Egypt, to think meant to see with the eye of the heart. In, in Chinese, to examine with the heart, and so on. I want to finish now. Techne in Greek means original knowledge, holistic knowledge. And the last thing is, in Japanese, economy, to manage the world, to help the people. Isn't it fascinating? Thank you very much, Francois. Mm. Thank you, Edwin. And yes, uh, as, I, as I shared, many languages don't use the verb to be. However, my point consists in exploring whatever language we live in, and we certainly have lots and lots of things to evolve there because language, whether we speak about Chinese, Japanese, or Mexican, or, or Brazilian, or whatever, they, they still have the structure and the consciousness of the pyramidal. It means pyramidal, when I speak pyramidal, I don't think about political structures there. I speak about also how language creates a way to look at the world and a kind of consciousness that supports this social system. So I bet that in any language in the world, we will have, find a way to the derivative of it, a way to improve it. Here comes my, my point on that. And thank you for all the things you shared. Anyone yes. else? Uh, Jean-François, uh, I've got a question, a little bit practical, mm -hmm. uh, regarding the uh, gift economy. Um, with your experience, that apparently you have for uh, a certain number of years, do you find that people, um, when, when you tell them, okay, this is a gift, what I'm giving you, and you can give to somebody else, you can give to me, whatever, that uh, most people will choose to give back to you? Uh, more than uh, to go and give out to somebody else. Is it not close enough? Sorry. D did you understand the question? It's just uh, just an information to, to, to see mm. how the functioning mm. functioning. Um. Well, true. When we feel gratitude for someone who gave us something that we really enjoy and appreciate and it has lots of usefulness, usually we want to manifest our gratitude back to that person. So on the physical move, it may look like an exchange. However, the motivations really work differently than the exchange because in the first place, someone offered something without the condition for a return, okay? You may have conditions. You know, for instance, when I give something for a company, I, I put conditions. I say, let's do it open source. You have to manifest your generosity to, to, get, to maintain the chain of generosity, you know, a certain set of conditions, but not the condition of reciprocity. And I make it very clear, for instance, if someone asks me for a conference, I, I have a conversation when I think, oh, yeah, nice project. I say to the person, okay, I offer you this conference. Because now we know the, we have, we know the whole agreement. And well, sometimes, yes, they, they feel happy and they want to give something to offer something but it never came in the first place as a negotiation or as a transaction um, and i again for any one of you who want to evolve into the gift economy because of what you what you do you will have to really go into very deep and profound social engineering really to have the right language not to bring the old poorism uh, kind of energy the free versus paying um, and also to, to coach people to really think what it means for uh, what it means to, to operate 
themselves in the gift economy. We have to educate people. Otherwise, they still make them with a scarce you know, model and say, well, I've already done something there, especially as a Norovillian, so I can take this given to me. But the person giving here will just die <laughs> because it won't work this way. It won't work in a circular way. So yes, thank you. Hmm. Maybe I, I have a, a question about the gift economy and the classic economy. Mm -hmm. Is there's not a, a go between? Mm -hmm. Because gift economy is very far, mm -hmm. and the classic economy we know what it is. And between that, what I know is entrepreneuriat social, mm -hmm. social entrepreneurship, which mix a kind of uh, normal economy, but with the, the people in the middle. So, what do you think about that? Mm. Well, I, I feel always happy when I see social entrepreneurship. However, I still see it as the old paradigm. So that means people in the old paradigm getting closer to the big jump. Um, because social entrepreneurship still operates at a wide scale with conventional money, and conventional money still, by design, condensates. That means concentrates in the hand of the few. We know that when we play the Monopoly game, by the way. You know, we start with an equal world. Everyone has the same amount of money. We play a little bit, buy and sell things. And the more money I have, the more I can invest. The more I can invest, the more I make. The more I make, the more I can invest, and so on. So money attracts money. On the contrary, if I have less money, I will have to pay more to the landlords and I have less and less money, okay? And so you have two curves, you know? The curve of the guy having more and more money and then the curve of the guys having less and less. And you have what we call the Pareto effect. Pareto effect means that money concentrates itself, okay? So a few people have a lot here and many people have almost nothing there. That means they cannot do exchange anymore, not because they have a lack of wealth, but just because they have a lack of the tool to exchange wealth, okay? A very absurd situation. So back to social entrepreneurship, it still plays with the, that kind of old uh, technology, although I know with social entrepreneurship that more and more people try, and try to find new ways of exchange. Now, from my experience, um, I, I really, really, uh, want to support with all my heart social entrepreneurship because it makes the shift to the next line, okay? On the practical level, I have learned that uh, I don't know how to live at the same time in the market economy and the gift economy. I've, I had my own transition period and I said it didn't work. I really had to jump, to make it work, to jump fully in the gift economy, to surrender to all the fears and to not listen to what people would tell me, that I would die, I would starve, people would suck my blood, you don't know, you give, you give, you give, don't know where it goes, you know, all the things that I, that I heard. And going there fully and really putting my vital at stake there allowed me to connect to that inner knowing that we all have to do the right thing at the right time, to follow the bliss, and to only operate from that place of bliss, what I call the bliss discipline. <laughs> <laughs> Trademark, no. <laughs> the bliss discipline. Um, because on a technical level, it gave me what I call the intelligence of the flow. And the intelligence of the flow, that means to manifest the right thing at the right time without any manipulation. Just follow your inner knowledge. And I think it has a lot of the practical, supplemental experience as an individual uh, being. I could not do that if I had one single piece of myself still left in the market economy, that means giving conditionally. The unconditional giving, that I means not waiting for the reciprocal and the reciprocity as a condition, helped me shift into a completely um, form of reality. And I know, I mean, we, we have to go there to really understand it. So I try to share as much as I can. Thank you. Thank you so much for offering your time to us. Um, I happen to live in India now since this January. 
and uh, I broke with my life from the West. I'm coming from Germany. I got married to uh, my wife. She's from India. And um, I'm experimenting with my life as well, that I try to go back, uh, to go away from the conventional system, that what I learned through education, I'm not offering that as a profession. I am offering something completely different. So I am offering uh, my knowledge as a sports coach. I have never gone to a university or any coaching school, nothing. It's just coming purely out of experience. Now. In my experience here in India, I recognize that what I have to offer is binding me to cities. A large group of people where I will find someone who is interested in what I have to offer. But a city is not necessarily where I would like to live. Now, what is your point on a few of if everyone is listening to their heart, which I'm doing at the moment, that I offer and do what I love to do, at the same time, it drives me to a large group of people which I don't want to be around with. <laughs> anyway, we will all die, so... <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think here comes the, always the super technical side of the, of the questions. Once we know what we want and what we don't want, and really express it very clearly. How do we go into the right technologies for that, the right, the right path? Well, so some of the things from my own experience, and I only speak from that, so I don't pretend you don't have anything else, okay? You have probably lots of other things to explore yourself. So far, what I have explored, uh, one thing for myself, no compromise. That means if I don't want to live there, I don't live there. If I don't want to do this, I don't do it. And my mind will tell me, well, you will fail, you will starve, you will not survive, and so on. But I decided I would never, ever do any compromise in my life. And, that, and then it really means that you, uh, you don't become a hostage anymore of yourself. Now, the second thing uh, that goes with it, make it very clear with others your intention, what you want to create. Make it clear on, in your physical life and make it clear online. Because online means people that you would not connect with uh, through your physical neighborhood. The third thing also, you always want to use imagination to not play anymore in the conventional arena. That means you want to invent something so cool and so unusual that people will travel the world to go and meet you. So you really want to work on that. And it becomes even easier because you make no compromise. That really stimulate, uh, stimulates the imagination. So that, that takes you way further than, for instance, sports coach. Maybe you have something to invent that doesn't even have those words, you know, through the body wisdom, through whatever. But you, you want to invent something so original and take all the possible risks, and you will have your own learning edge, and yes, you will make mistakes. But for me, from my experience, I have always proceeded this way, and it worked. It worked. I've done crazy things, and I still do lots of crazy things, but it, it works because I, I kind of follow these things, the, the trust, the, um, and the, so the non -com no compromise thing, then become very technical, like website, uh, find the right words, and become super creative so that whatever I do, no one else in the world uh, does it. So I, I changed, I evolved myself into an artist. And I really think uh, it is very important as a step we can do our own evolution to all become artists. That means we stop becoming problem solvers, like solving, fixing the world, for instance. If I try to save the world, if I try to, if I become a social activist, by the way, I have very high chances that I polarize myself with a world that I don't want anymore. I just respond to a problem. And then my life becomes a whole problem solving thing. Super boring. <laughs> Super boring. And, I, and by doing that, by the way, I kind of leave aside creativity. So I become reactive rather than becoming creative. So I try to follow this, this thing like, and also in martial arts, you know, if someone attacks you, the first thing you, you do, you don't stand in the way. You step aside. 
Okay, so creating something means not staying in the way, not playing the conventional rules and you know the the kind of conventional feedback you will have. Go to play in a different place where no one has played already, where the action doesn't come uh, to you. I try to follow these guidelines. Maybe uh, you have many others that you will you will try. I don't know if it helps. My pleasure. How have the processes um, been in um, uh, having it from your immediate I self to the next we eyes directly around you, <laughs> meaning family, meaning partner, meaning friendships? And how far has these friendships been supportive? Mm. Uh, or not, mm. and how did it get from the A to the B in that sense? Mm. So I guess you ask about the, the role of my social environment into uh, this transformation. Well, at first, I, I really had three year, the years to completely redesign, I mean, allow a complete redesign of my social interactions. Um, that means I have no more social life in the conventional sense, but whatever, whenever I engage with people, that means uh, I can go in the most possible depth of time and presence together, which doesn't mean serious. I love doing the most unserious things, and my friends know me about that. Um, now, at the family level, uh, no support at all. Uh, I would just say um, very hostile response, which I think has a very classical, um, you know, context. Um, so, but some, some people may have a family support. I did not. Um, more mostly hostility. But very, very dear friends uh, supporting me unconditionally. That means not asking for any kind of uh, result, just supporting. And that really makes a whole difference. And he taught me also something important about the gift economy. You know, in the gift economy, we have the hero's role when we give, <sighs> right? <laughs> I give, people say thank you, and <sighs> feels good, right? Receiving unconditionally makes the other part. That means you receive and you don't feel any debt. That one <laughs> means a little more work, okay? And after all these years, when someone gives me, I still feel that emotion and, and I have to let go a sense of depth. And that makes a gift, by the way, for the person who offers, because that person can offer me as a real gift, right? So we have to, it also develops the empathy level where you can, you can go into circles and see how it plays, which you usually never do in the conventional uh, market economy. So back to your question, I, I really had a huge amount of support and I do have a huge amount of support uh, from people in different places of the world and very close uh, friends and people who really became my family, uh, my spiritual family. And without them, I don't know how I would have done because they really provide the immediate support I have always had a place to sleep, always food, always, you know, the minimum amount of money, conventional money, to face, you know, the next weeks or 15 days or month. And uh, I, ha I feel absolutely huge gratitude for that. Yes. So thank you to them. Some of them are uh, in the room here. <laughs> yes. Sorry? <laughs> one of them in the room here. <laughs> I mean one, yes. Esteban in the back, <laughs> here, yes, who came to me uh, to, to India, and, uh, and same thing, uh, he came because of a gift, because of people who understand that I travel a lot, and I, I offered uh, also for his, uh, his trip here, and so we travel a lot together. And same thing, I had to reinvent the father-son relationship. I really let go of the fatherhood in the conventional sense, which means that I decided that I would leave aside any sense of duty. I don't have any duty with this little boy here. I mean it, because then we can build what we want to build as two human beings, as two souls.
And yes, it has some father, fatherhood taste and, and masculine figure and all these things, but because it emerges as something we design, you know, but not as any kind of duty. So I hope it answers also your, your question. Yes? Um, in your experiences of uh, research of social engineering or collective intelligence around the world, do you know any good examples of collective intelligence groups, cities, that you would like to share mm. with us? Holamidal collective intelligence already plays everywhere. But if we try to see it like what kind of city or what kind of company what kind of government, place like that, we won't see them. Just like uh, in the early days of flight, if we ask, have you seen any cars that fly? No, because we invent something completely different. So, holomido means you, you can see it in a different angle. Think of any question, any important question like healthcare, education, transportation, energy, and see how people self-organize themselves to embrace these questions. What tools do they use? Take any example, and by the way, I work on a, on a movie that will try to show that, you know, take any example. You, you can take cars, for instance, go on a, on a search engine and, and type in open car, for instance, and then you will see people in a few months, they can design cars that run better with less fuel, less energy, than what the pyramidal industry makes. And you can take in, and you can go in every possible domain and you will see the old pyramidal collective intelligence response and the holomidal collective intelligence response. But you can't really circumscribe it as one organization that does this or one city that does that because it works like clouds and connectedness, you know? So it doesn't have much of a, you know, shape, a contour, you know? But, think of the rhizome and then you you will see it absolutely everywhere and of course just studying you know i don't say it will exist as something uh, easy with no no problems and no issues i by the way don't pitch you know like easy tomorrows <laughs> we have lots of issues to to solve and lots of threats but we can already see holomidal collective in intelligence at play now to give more concrete names on that um um and, um, Wikipedia, for instance. Wikipedia, the widest global encyclopedia, came exactly like software organizing people together to share knowledge and make a, an encyclopedia. We have an example of phenomenal kind of collective intelligence. Um, when you look at um, couch surfing, couch surfing, gift economy at a massive scale. That means I can go in any place in the world, or mostly, and find someone to offer his couch or a bed to the traveler. And I can also welcome in my place in France, uh, people who travel if I want to and offer a bedroom or a couch or, or something. Um, so with couch surfing, we see an online platform that enables um, a gift economy at a wide scale. And those things work a lot by the holomidal collective intelligence still entangled a lot with the old world as well, okay? Not black and white. Transition of ecosystems, going a little further here and here and here, okay? But still a lot entangled in the conventional world. Let me make that very clearly. I don't know if it addresses your, your question. What you ask about the, the physical reality, I think those examples that I shared have lots of physicality. That means people meeting one another. Uh, you, you know, we, we see a lot in the pyramidal world that the headlines on the newspaper, like, you know, this president meeting this president and working for this and that and arguing on this and that. We will never see in the conventional newspaper something that says, look how many millions of people invited themselves <laughs> in their couch, you know, in the house, and all the connections it created in the world and how much it works for peace. Because it works in a super distributed way, so you can't grasp it as a strong signal. It works as weak signals. But for me, it has a huge reality. For me, it has a huge reality if, uh, uh, I, again, I take the, the, the example of tweets. I find the right tweet at the right time, at the right moment, and it connects me with, with people. And then we will do something together. Or I will, I will add some slide on my conference, who knows what. And then it will have ripples in the physical world. But we have to, to see it more from the world of weak signals than the strong signals, from my perspective. 
Yes. Thank you for all this uh, food for thought. Um, you have spoken of organ organization, governance, and economy. What about education, mm. which is another pillar? Uh, because I have noticed that in Auroville, in the beginning, I mean, it was made by people who were quite ignorant. So there was a project was very, it was about going beyond money, beyond school, beyond governance. And then the more educated people came in, the more it became pyramidal mm. and monetarized, <laughs> fiscalized. And uh, so there is something, it has something to do with education too. What, do you, what, is, what are your views on education? Well, first, this, this uh, move, that, this uh, phenomenon that you, that you mentioned, I, I see it in, uh, in Noroville and many other places happening in every other domain. You have a small group of pioneers really go super radical as pioneers and then it, it grows and grows and grows and then that brings it more and more complexity and usually the only answer we had so far to complexity means going pyramidal that means bringing some we can't do anymore the gift economy because it becomes too complex we don't know how to balance the whole thing uh, we've tried lots and lots of things in education but then we see okay what do we do with that and we made lots of mistakes, so let's have some people from the old world uh, come in. And you can do that for architecture, you can, you can see that for energy, you know. So the, I think what you describe has a, a wider pattern about growth. You have people going super pioneers and, and wild in some domain. I could talk about a startup as well, you know, or any or a city or a territory. A school, for instance, the, the, the school of my child has a very, very same issue. It began small and now it becomes bigger and bigger. And they have this inner tension between pyramidal, efficient, fast, boom, solutions. But, well, we use the same, the same thing. We bring back the scarcity model. We bring back the same old memes, we see the world the same way, and we still reproduce the same old world just for the sake of growing. So we try to find something different. Let's make circles and committees who try to address things from a different perspective, and they try to coordinate, but we don't know how to do this. So let's have something on top that will try to coordinate the thing, and bam, 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 and we go back into the pyramidal thing. Now, mostly because people still do these things with the we in the I. That means they keep speaking the same language, they keep using conventional money, they keep having the same social codes, they keep having the same kind of body, they keep having more or less the same kind of food and so on. And that really, for me, makes the, the old come back in the new, the old DNA come back in the new again and again and again. And your example in education, I think we could take it in every uh, other single domain. So back to concrete, proposals for, for, to, to avoid that really go into the invisible architectures. That means go into the body, go holoptical, and address all these points about the we in the eye that I tried to, to share. I don't see them as the ultimate solution. I don't come with that kind of, of, of mind. But at least I see them as some of the critical conditions for success. I don't see how Oroville or any projects about shifting consciousness can succeed with conventional money, for instance. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe we can accomplish a few things, but like going against the stream, you know? I don't see how Auroville can succeed if we keep speaking the same old language because it has built in archaic structures of consciousness that we perpetuate through language and so on. So I, I really would like to share with all my heart how important those things feel to, to me. I hope it feeds your it builds on your question. My pleasure. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for all what you shared. Uh, I have two questions, two curiosities. Uh, first one is, I would like to have your sense about um, our organization in Ohovia, uh, our visible architecture in groups. Um, does, it, does it contribute to the, to the Olomidal 
can mm -hmm. we reach that or do we have to really review the, the whole organization? And second curiosity I have is, um, is the tools I re which I really appreciate uh, is really a commitment within myself to, to evolve. And I'm wondering when you are working with uh, society, uh, companies, for example, how, how can, what kind of agreements you suggest, you inspire to work with in order already as a group to change in a soft way or mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, yeah, okay. what do you suggest? So for your first question, well, how do I see uh, how it works uh, in, uh, in Oroville? As I shared earlier, from what I have heard so far, and just what I have heard, so I don't pretend I have seen everything, far from that thought, I hear lots of violence at play, emotional violence, frustration, uh, harshness, resentment, um, wounds, people really getting hurt. Uh, tired also and when I when I ask well for instance how do you how do you meet what happens and I usually hear well we have people speaking and uh, interrupting and arguing and has to go fast and so on so that keeps people in the mental because those social architectures got meant to work with the mental to support the mental not to support the supramental not to support inspiration. They don't work for that. They serve another level of evolution, those social codes. So if uh, people want to evolve in those groups, they have lots of tools available for them that they have to learn, of course. For instance, they can start with a moment of silence and meditation to center, to let go the whole thing. They can apply an architecture like uh, some of you know it in this uh, room, what we, we call the six agreements. The first one, breathe before speaking. And you have a few other ones that really support that. They can apply and learn a new governance system like holacracy, for instance, which really organizes in a super uh, organic and fractal way the, the, the way to organize ourselves. And for instance, to dissociate the immediate answers that we need for day-to-day, for, you know, uh, things versus the governance, uh, the big governance questions. I mean, lots and lots of things. We have architectures at, uh, available for us that people have already tried and improve that you can, some groups can try, at least not all reveal, but at least some groups can try to see, wow, well, maybe if we do this and this and this, then we work much better. And we invite deeper consciousness. Whatever architecture those groups will take, if they don't balance being and doing, that means silence, inspiration, and action, how can they succeed? How can they deal? How can they evolve and operate from a deeper place of consciousness? I don't know. I have no clue, but I don't think they will succeed. And sorry if I, I make it so, you know, so direct, but I speak with my heart here. How can they succeed if they play with the old conventional social ecosystem. So now to your second question. I spent some time with, uh, with some companies and mostly with uh, some leaders of these companies. People have lots of conventional power, okay, as CEOs or political power or media power, some of them. Um, what these people have in common, why do they, you know, I don't take my phone to call them. Hey, let's do something together. <laughs> let's go along it all. <laughs> no, no. It, go, it goes from, you know, word to mouth. Uh, and so usually they call me and I check with them. And what they all have in common, regardless of the projects we work on, I have the power, so what? I have pyramidal power, so what? I feel as trapped as before, I don't feel that happy, I don't feel freedom, and I feel whatever I do, we will make winners on one side and losers on one side. And I didn't come to do that. I mean, those people have that in common. Maybe they don't state it with the way I do, but when we speak a little bit, we come to this point. And so the question we explore together consists in saying, okay, you have a pyramidal structure, 
Good. Why don't you use it as a fertile soil to support the next ecosystem? It doesn't have to go against. Now, your company already exists. It has jaws and teeth and claws to work in a competitive environment, to dominate, to take, to extract, to you know, put pressure on people, to deal with the scarce money. It already exists. However, we can make it more gentle, more clever, to support holomidal projects. So we do those, those things and we work under those terms and conditions. Otherwise, I see no interest. But that's, that just affects a very small, tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of, uh, of people. However, more than a lifetime to do things with them. Yes. Thank you for offering us your time today. Hmm. I'm very grateful for that. Uh, you mentioned uh, that we will have to bring about a change in the food. Now, when you have made that change into live food, that's wonderful. But uh, currently, as our environment and the way our food structure stands, to make a shift for a lot of people into the live food will end up depleting the resources before even, like, you know, we can do anything about it. What do you think about mm. that? Well, uh, first, I would never claim that I have an answer to any of those big issues, food, energy, and so on. I just trust that uh, some people start something and other people do something and so on. It goes by waves. And I trust the wave, the collective holomidal wave for that. So I don't have an answer to, to food. I have a few, a few clues, however. For instance, on the uh, footprint level or ecosystemic level, Eating fruits offer the best footprint uh, ever that we can have, and on the ecosystemic. How do we go there globally? I have no clue. However, I know that lots of uh, breakthroughs happen, like urban farming. Uh, and so, you know, cities represent potential huge, amazing ecosystems. If we, if we go into this, uh, this mind, sta mind states, but I have no clue. So I can, and all the things that I, you could ask for, you know, how do you want people to evolve language, for instance? I have no clue. At least I start, and maybe someone else will start, and we'll see, you know? <laughs> I can only give this kind of answer. Yeah, you, we've been talk, you've been talking about collective intelligence, but then in the end you said what I can do is personal. Mm -hmm. I can do something, hopefully it will work in waves. Mm -hmm. How do the two things combine mm -hmm. together? Uh, the experience has shown me that opposing the I and the we, I mean, um, the individual and the collective, also comes as a mental construct. I see absolutely no difference between my own evolution and the evolution of humanity. I just, I just have to do it within myself. Now, if I, if I look back and make it a narrative rather than a principle, all the things that I have shared so, so, so far these past years have already transformed so many lives and so many people in the world, not because of my actions, but because of inspiration. It's, it seemed that I inspired some people doing that. I didn't try to make a point, I didn't try to convince them, and I don't try to convince you, as you know, just sharing. And I see that, you know, it takes one man to walk on the moon for the whole humanity to have walked on the moon. It takes one man to fly so that whole humanity will experience flight. So I really don't worry about those questions of critical mass. You know, when a critical mass happens, it means that all the steps before that happened, maybe in the soul of one person, it happened first, one seed. So the big things begin with the infinitely small. Even as bodies, we began with one little cell, you know? So I, knowing those things and knowing that the whole lives in the part as well, and not just the part in the whole. As uh, Aurobindo says so, so clearly, you know, the mental feels so at ease seeing parts in the whole, but so weak at seeing the whole in the parts. But if we keep that as a deep knowledge, I think the opposition between the I and the we gets completely resolved, at least for me. I have no, I mean, as my direct and most profound experience, I don't, even I use the I language in the old world, but have absolutely no feeling that I do, I do something individual. 
I, f I see the collective and the I playing, operating exactly at the same time, the I, 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 as we say. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.